Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone. My name is Lance Gore. I'm a principal specialist at Asia Development Bank. And I have the pleasure of being your moderator for this, the fifth and unfortunately final session of the ADB Water and Delta Seminar Series for this season. Uh, I'd like to welcome Nadine Slochez from Deltes, who is the Manager of Water Operations and Early Warning at Deltes, to make her presentation today, which will be on the future of hydrological, future of hydrological forecasting, a scenario analyst. Over to you, Nadine. Thank you. Thank you, Lance, for this introduction and your very uh, good pronunciation of my uh, Dutch family name. Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome from Delft, the Netherlands. Uh, thank you for tuning in and joining my presentation today on the future of uh, hydrological forecasting. I'm very grateful to the ADB for this opportunity to pre present this scenario study to such a large audience. Before I start, uh, first a brief introduction of who I am, who is speaking today, uh, briefly announced by Lance, I'm the department manager for Deltaris. Uh, I lead a group of about 40 uh, hydrologists and software developers. And uh, together we strive to reduce the impact of floods and droughts by improving the real-time decision-making. And we do this through a combination of applied research related to hydrological forecasting and early warning and software development that allows this knowledge to put into practice. We work all over the world together with universities, research institutes, cons consultants, and of course, with uh, many governmental organizations. Uh, next to that, I'm also responsible for expanding our network and research uh, capabilities in the region for Australia, New Zealand, and uh, the Pacific. And I'm also very happy that I am uh, a member of the uh, operational team for our famous Dutch uh, movable storm surge barrier, the Maastland barrier that protects the port of Rotterdam from flooding. It's an aut automatically operating storm surge barriers and we are responsible uh, with my team uh, that it takes the right decision at the right time. Well, Today, my presentation, uh, I will start with a short introduction on uh, our philosophy, philosophy, the way we approach enabling better decision making before I uh, will introduce you to the future. Um, and I will end with uh, our vision actually on the future and how we will adapt to a changing world. So first, an introduction on um, the enabling better real-time decision-making. Talking about real-time decision-making, the question is how can government authorities be accurately informed when a flood or a drought is about to occur? And how can they inform all parties and people involved with the right information at the right time to allow for appropriate response? That is the question that we help governments with uh, to answer. And we do this in setting up a, or helping actually to set up a solid operational flood management infrastructure to respond effectively and avoiding damage and saving lives. And our philosophy is to co-create solutions together with clients. And the reason for co-creation is that a successful operational flood management inf infrastructure does not just include software and hardware, but also people, processes, and institutional policies. With over 30 years of experience in this field, we have learned that the critical success factors are institutional embedding and ownership, and the system and organization needs continuous attention and engagement. And we believe that co-creation and capacity building are key to achieve this. A very simple system that is really being used is far more effective than a the full-scale top-notch system that nobody knows how to operate. So that is our philosophy for um, better uh, real-time decision-making. In addition to what I've just mentioned, the technical side of enabling better real-time decision-making is of course also important. Uh, the data that is to support the decisions are often fragmented within organizations, while forecasting process often are manual and cumbersome. Effectively managing the water resources means structuring the data efficiently, providing staff and other stakeholders with easy access to the right information. 
And in order to manage data and models, we developed an open platform, Delphuse, of which you may have heard of. And Delphuse is an open model integration platform that brings together hydrological and meteorological data, different types of models, in order to make real-time forecasts and issuing warnings. The platform was uh, already developed in the 90s as a hydrological forecasting and warning system, uh, but it's now being used in many other water-related domains, such as water quality, groundwater monitoring, and real-time control. And the open architecture of FUSE makes it easy for an organization to connect to their own data sets and own models and uh, set it up to their own needs. And the models known and available in the organization can direct be integrated without the expense of development of new models. And we believe that this also helps with the embedding of a new system uh, into an organization. So this slide shows um, where we are working all around the world and where we have helped many organizations in setting up operational management systems. Uh, the area with the yellow star, that are um, organizations where uh, the Delphi system is being used as nationwide system. So that means for the US, the UK, Australia, and of course also the Netherlands. Um, our clients are the larger forecasting agencies, hydropower companies, but also regional water authorities. And we prefer to work with local consultants in order to build capacity and to secure support and maintenance after the project. Uh, an interesting uh, different point of view of looking at uh, what we do is that if you look at the total area that is being covered by the Delphi system, so I mean the, that area that relies on forecast made through the Delphi system, it covers off about 33% of the global GDP. And um, for sure, we are very proud of that, but it also gives a large responsibility in relation to quality of the software and our expertise. And that is also the reason why, did, why we did the scenario analysis uh, for the future, because we want to be uh, state of the art. Uh, we think that we uh, owe this to our clients. Furthermore, um, our philosophy is, is open and also community-based. And it means on the one hand that uh, if one organization, for example, invests in research or new software development, that the whole community can benefit from that. Uh, also sharing knowledge within the community is an important thing. And for that reason, we uh, organize regional events uh, on the annual basis and also one event per year where everyone can attend. Of course, we use also our website to, uh, to share information. Well, after this introduction, I've come to the part of the presentation where I will introduce you to the future of hydrological forecasting in 2025. As said before, we feel a large responsibility to our users to provide state-of-the-art expertise and tools. And we also would like to provide this in the future. However, the world is changing, hence we need to anticipate those changes. So for this reason, we started an exploration of the future in order to develop new strategies. Even though the scenarios were already developed back in 2017, uh, they are still up to date, although I've changed them for today uh, a small bit uh, to keep them uh, as much as up to date as possible. You can uh, read the scenarios as well in a report that you can download from our website with a blog also also written by Jan Vergade. And all credits for the study go to the writers for the, of the future scenarios. The group of writers consisted of a combination of employees from Deltares, the University IHE, the Dutch National Water Management Center, and a meteorologist. So the exploration of the future, what were the questions that we would like to see answered? Questions were like, will governments still be forecasting for the general public? Will governments still be forecasting for the general public? Will forecasting still be based on process models, such as rainfall runoff models? And who will be the supplier of forecasting systems? We cannot know the answer to these questions with certainty, but we can develop multiple plausible scenarios. And that is what we did. The question is, what are the forces that influence the world of hydrological forecasting? The world is changing. What are the kind of things that are changing? Political forces are important, maybe? Well, at this moment, definitely the impact of COVID, demographic forces, the increase of the world population, climate change, increasing populations in flood-prone areas, um, technological forces, 
big data, Internet of Things, cloud, and the way we communicate. So our macro environment is changing and the question is, how uh, are these things impacting the real-time hydrological forecasting? And at Deltaris, we did the scenario analysis to see how we as Deltaris uh, should, uh, what kind of research we should doing, uh, what kind of strategy we should uh, uh, go for. Uh, but I think uh, these scenarios can also be relevant for your organization. So that's why I'm so uh, happy that I can uh, present to you today these scenarios. So what was the approach of this scenario analysis? There were five authors, they wrote five scenarios in five days of full-time writing. We started with a brainstorm session with a large group of people. Uh, there were two key variables defined, uh, which we thought, okay, th these are very important in relation to uh, the hydrological forecasting and the way it, uh, it, we do it. It's the governmental focus and the technological focus. The scenarios consist uh, of a storyline, and in this storyline, a description uh, is given from the path to 2025, and also a storyline uh, from a person in a day in the life of. Furthermore, uh, included is, uh, in this scenario, what the effects are in terms of the, the way we uh, do uh, research, uh, collaborate in, uh, together with other uh, organizations and the markets. In the end, there were nine possible scenarios. We had three um, possible gov government uh, scenarios and uh, three on the technological. So here you can see the, the focus. So this is governmental focus. There we had traditional government, regulatory government, and defined as a global. And this means that it's actually, there is community-based forecasting, but with the latest hydrological forecasting technology. Globally progressive, but locally relevant, and therefore the word global was uh, uh, defined. Uh, on the technological focus, there was uh, opportunistic. So uh, we do it because we can. Then the user-oriented, um, people are asking for it. So that's the reason why we do it and protectionism, and protectionism is uh, related to uh, protecting the data, uh, the security aspects, etc. So in total, there uh, can be nine scenarios, but we uh, made uh, five out of nine. So these are the five scenarios, and that I will uh, elaborate more in this presentation. We have uh, the caring government, so that's a traditional government focused on the end user. We have uh, the regulator, regulatory facilitator and the mode. Um, this is a regulatory government. Uh, the one is um, focused on opportunistic, so uh, with a, a lot of technology, and the mode is more protectionism. Um, in the end, it turned out that uh, these two scenarios, although they were written with uh, two different persons, uh, were quite similar. So I will um, describe them as one scenario. Um, and then we have uh, Google Forecasts and Startup Society in, and in these scenarios, actually the, in, uh, the government has um, not so much a role or not at all. So what I will do, I uh, will go into the scenarios and I will uh, give a short summary of the scenario. So you get a, get a bit of a feeling of this future and, and then I uh, uh, summarize it, the characteristics of this scenario. Starting with the caring government. This is a slide that is also part of the report. The path to 2025 with a view to greater efficiency and to avoid the duplication of work, political bodies decided to merge all water entities into one joint national water management center. Furthermore, it was found that the services with a joint approach would have an added value for the users. Civic participation in design and implementation is now part of the normal functioning of the National Water Management Center. There is a focus on the end user needs and tailor-made products are being developed. People no longer question the need for investments in public services. So what are the characteristics of this caring government? Forecasting is organized in one central government organizations and they are also responsible for the forecast, they produce them themselves. And there is a focus on end users. So for the farmers, navigation, those kind of things. We have approached this scenario uh, more or less as uh, business as usual. 
Then the regulatory facilitator and the mode together. The regulatory facilitator. In the past to 2025, between 2017 and 2025, the government stated that the number of civil servants should decrease. The government has no longer executive tasks, but continues to bear responsibility. This change results from the fact that more and more small businesses have entered the weather and water markets. They are potentially better in dealing with the technologies. Another trigger was that the government decided that provision of safety could be left to other parties than the government. Although there is some concern about dependency on commercial parties, it is found that innovation from startups is even more important. Technological developments and research were transferred to other organizations. In 2024, the production of weather and hydro forecasts are transferred to the company that come with the best offer. The characteristics of this regulatory facilitator. It's a cost-efficient government and they don't have no longer executive tasks, but they are still responsible. The hydrological forecasts are being made by commercial companies and there is also an impulse for forecasting as a service. When you look at the mode, then uh, this regulatory facilitator uh, is added to uh, uh, strict regulations in related to data and production processes, but also certification is important and data property uh, of the producer. Then the startup society, the path to 2025. 2020 was a year of change with COVID. As a result, various social initiatives emerged taking advantage of the revolution of information and communication technology. More and more data become available. Multinationals and smaller businesses are taking advantage of these amount of data to develop new services. The nature of the required information also changes. Hydrologists notice there is less demand for hazard forecasting, but more on impact forecasting. By 2021, the government decides to decrease public services. It is found that there are enough suitable parties to take over these services. As a result, weather services were closed down, the ministries became 50% smaller, and the funding of a large number of knowledge parties were stopped. Part of the work for hydrologists is taken over by people who can translate technology into practice and are capable of processing large amounts of data and capable of translating the results for the general public. Communication tools such as flashy infographics, augmented reality apps and interactive films are popular. The ultimate word, magic word is impact. The players that make the transition, translation to the act actual impact of forecast are the most successful. The characteristics. So the startup society, no government involved, it's fully formed by citizens and startups. Um, there's a lot of innovation, new technology. Uh, the focus is on the use of the forecast. So what are the impacts of the forecasts? And effective use. Those are the two main characteristics of this scenario. Then what is called the scenario Google forecasts. The path to 2025. In the years leading up to 2025, sharing data and open source have become the new normal. Due to global protectionism, the trust in the governments had never been so low. In the meanwhile, technology had not stood still and had a major consequence for hydrological forecasting. Global hydrological models had quickly been brought down to a scale at which hydrological information was available at the scale of the garden. Of course, the data contained uncertainties, but these could be made visible using new communication technologies. High resolution global hydrological forecasts have become a reality and are now being offered by companies such as Google, the Google Global Forecasting System. The accessibility of global information gives confidence more so than the do the hydrological forecasts previously made by government agencies. The trust in public services was further dented by the floods at the end of January 2021. Government agencies that did not collaborate properly, politici politicians who initially wanted to save their own skin and the non-disclosure of important information. Like many other hydrological agencies, the Weather Service stopped making hydrological forecasts mid-2022. The distance between the global scale of Google forecasting and the reliability and relevance at the local scale are very short. 2025. The characteristics of this scenario. The data is everywhere, there's no protection, 
global hydrological prediction. Everyone can um, uh, uh, can use it, um, and no predictions at all from the government. Well, it's uh, of course based up on something that is already maybe a bit going on in relation to the the Google forecast as uh, as presented here on the slide, at least with the warnings. Well, these were the five scenarios with the different plausible futures. They were all they are all as plausible uh, at the same uh, similar plaus plausibility. But most likely, the future will look like a combination of aspects of these different scenarios. So what have we learned from these scenarios? What we did is that we identified the aspects that are important within these different scenarios and the aspects of which we already have an indication that they will likely to happen. So what is our vision of the future? We think that in 2025, big data has brought artificial intelligence also in the heart of the water domain. Hydrologists will, for hydrological forecasts will no longer based exclusively on physically based process models, but they will be enriched by artificial intelligence. Furthermore, digital connections between people will be even, more, even stronger than in 2020, and digital technology, shared global standards, and cloud sharing will be the norm. People expect from government authorities to supply information directly. The public and businesses want services that deliver information in terms of impact on themselves and on the society as a whole. And these developments will also have major implications for hydrological forecasting. We believe that forecasters in 2025 need to process large amounts of data, assess more models and describe also the potential impact of extreme weather and water events. And they have to communicate their prognosis, including the uncertainties, to a wider public using new visualization methods. The ease of access to data and software and the availability of forecasting as a service mean that the hydrological forecast will no longer be exclusively made by experts at the larger forecasting agencies. Smaller organizations with restricted resources will also have access to hydrological predictions for their area of interest, such as smaller communities. And obviously, we can never predict the exact shape that future will take. However, we believe that we can adapt to change by developing highly modular open software in which data handling and easy connections are key. Our software needs to be able to handle large amounts and new types of data. It has to connect easily to external data sources and other software applications and communication tools. In 2025, Delfuse has developed into a type of ecosystem. Delfuse is at the core, dovetailing with other software applications and tools to deliver solutions tailored for the end users. This resulted also in our software vision. If you are interested in more detail, please visit our website mentioned here on this slide. Furthermore, the scenario study helped us in identifying research topics for the coming years, as mentioned on this slide. Global modeling, impact forecasting, now casting, but also new types of data and information. For example, mining Twitter data and the use of that. We are already uh, working together with, uh, for example, Floodex, Floodtex, uh, with this regard, communication technology and machine learning, how they, can they help to improve the hydrological forecasting and the real-time decision-making? And last but not least, together with the community of real-time hydrological forecasting, we are continuing to improve hydrological forecasting domain with the ultimate aim of mitigating the impact of extreme weather by taking informed and timely action. And with this slide, I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. You can visit always our website for more information. Uh, but of course, I can um, imagine that there are also some questions in the chat that, uh, well, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, and I think it's always useful to, to look into the future and down the road and, and certainly as far as the horizon to see what's coming in the near future. And I think you've... you've uh, uh, discuss some things which uh, certainly hasn't been on on our radar in terms of different scenarios of how the future could unfold in the next few years. I think a lot of us are just trying to make it through the current day or, or month at the moment. But anyway, I'll hand it over to participants. If they'd like to make any comments, just set some ground rules. Uh, if you could just uh, raise your hand or mention in the chat that you have a question for Nadine and keep your microphones off until you're invited to to speak. Thank you. So while we wait, from, maybe I can just uh, raise a question from my own perspective. I, I work a lot at the moment in the South Asian 
area. And one of the things there that we face and have faced for a long time is, is the, just the paucity of data, real actual data. Um, it makes very hard to do any extreme analysis, any type of forecasting on, on what the next season or the, the next monsoon period or the next water availability you're expecting for the next uh, forthcoming, you know. Um, I noticed on the map that you showed that you've worked in and around the, the Asian area, uh, not maybe not particularly in India, but what, what are your views there? And do you see the what you've talked about today, is there, is there opportunities there to overcome this, this lack of data, help us with our uh, forecasting? Well, um, I definitely see that there will... Uh, that this problem, so to say, uh, will be solved uh, in the future with the upcoming uh, availability of, of more data. What we see is uh, that on one hand, we have, of course, a lot of uh, new data available from uh, Earth observations, uh, but also uh, initiatives to have more uh, data uh, mining uh, from, uh, let's say, the, the community, some community initiatives. Uh, for example, I don't think this is really relevant for more the seasonal forecast, but uh, uh, but maybe it is uh, the Twitter mining. I do believe that uh, new types of data that they will uh, improve indeed the the forecasts. However, uh, the challenge is that we bring it together and that we uh, have to look how we can use this this data and also what is the quality of this data. Um, so that other challenges, I think, for the coming coming years. But I, I definitely, and maybe I'm a, a bit opportunistic, uh, that um, uh, the lack of data can be uh, decreased with these this new types of data. And this is relevant to Paul Taylor's comment, where he talks about uh, one of the more difficult elements in hydrology is obtaining reliable field data and flow and discharge, which involves physical equipment and field activity. Do you see the future of technical developments reducing the need for the physical side? And if so, how would you, that occur? Yeah. What we, for example, now are, are working on is that we uh, work more on the machine learning side of things. I, I don't think this will uh, completely um, overtake the, the, the physical uh, the, the data and the monitoring data, but uh, I do believe that uh, we can train also models with, uh, uh, with machine learning. At this moment, we, of course, uh, the hydraulic forecast, we already improved them uh, by using data assimilation and uh, are quite difficult techniques. But I think that, that this is something that in future will definitely help to uh, yeah, improve also the quality of the data. So that's mm, okay. my answer. That leads on to uh, uh, Anita Jobson's uh, comment, which is yeah. who will be responsible for validating data yeah. if the public uh -huh. institutes are no longer generating forecasts. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that, uh, I mean, in one of the scenarios, there was, uh, of course, uh, no government involved. But I um, I think, especially when you look at the more forecasting as a service, then, uh, well, for instance, um, commercial parties will provide the, the forecasts and they also have to, well, uh, uh, provide uh, the, the quality of this, uh, of this data. And I think, well, that's that's a dif difficult aspect because do um, you really uh, want to rely on commercial parties to um, it, well um, are be responsible for, for such an important uh, important thing? Um, so I wonder, uh, in the end, of the, uh, whether the commercial parties will uh, really be responsible for for this uh, this validation. Um, so. Well, I think this scenario is maybe a bit far away uh, in, in that sense. So that's uh, maybe it's not really answering uh, the whole question of, with relation to the validation, but that's also a, str a struggle for us. Uh, I mean, also the, uh, on the one hand from the government side, but also from uh, if we look at, uh, well, there are questions for forecasting as a service, but also on our end, uh, do we want to take that responsibility to, uh, for these type of forecasts? Okay, I guess my point of view on this is depends on, on what scale uh, and w what is the boundary of, of your interest in hydrological forecasting. So if you're a farmer, uh, you want to know what the rainfall is going to be next season or, or next week, uh, then you can subscribe to a service-based uh, system which could yeah. use 
earth observation, uh, or it could use ground sensors uh, and uh, rainfall uh, rainfall meters. Um, and if you're not happy with that service, then there's probably a marketplace there for you to, to change your service provider. But if you're looking at more of a river basin level where it's a matter of governance and, and the public institutions must take responsibility for that, then they must always remain responsible for yeah. Uh, for the quality of the data, the data collection, quality and forecasting. Um, and that's unfortunately something that uh, we, we have a lack of in, in parts of the world where there is a lack of data. Uh, there's a lack of quality archiving and, and sharing of that data and, and decision making based on that data. Um, so, so I think there's still a lot of work there to be done in, in different areas of, of some of the aspects of the presentation you gave. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, th thank you for your uh, additional uh, <laughs> remarks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so on, on to the next question from uh, Lewis Cruz: uh, How would climate change uh, make an impact on the future of hyd hydrological forecasting by 2025? Well, I think, uh, I mean, the hydrology will still be the same also with, uh, uh, with climate change and uh, maybe uh, the frequency of more extreme weather events will, will uh, increase. So in that sense, I don't think it, it really has an impact, but uh, what the uh, impact is, is that it is very, very effective uh, flood protection measure. And that is uh, that is what I think. It's it's quite let's say uh, cheap in relation to the more infrastructural measures. Um, so in that sense, um, that is how I look at the impact of uh, of climate change. That is becoming more and more important that you uh, um, have a, a, well a solid uh, water management center or forecasting center. Mm, okay. Forecasts. Jason Chin raises an interesting point. Uh, he may want to um, speak himself, but he's asking uh, for smaller governments with limited resources and budget for a forecasting model, would this exciting future make it even more difficult since technology is the main focus? Jason, do you want to add to that comment? I'll give you a few seconds to unmute your microphone. If not, Nadine, do you, can you yeah. respond? Um... Well, if I understand it correctly, then uh, what you're saying is that, uh, well, the smaller governments have less, have limited resources, so they, they, they can't also build a forecasting model, etc. cetera. Um, what I believe is that um, if there is uh, more service related uh, forecasting provision, so uh, maybe, maybe on the global scale, but it can also be local. Uh, so if there are providers for forecasting as a service, then in that sense, uh, the smaller governments or, uh, or cities can just uh, uh, use that service uh, instead of being responsible and uh, uh, run their own forecasts. So in that sense, uh, I, I uh, uh, I don't think it is, it's more difficult because they don't have to, uh, well, have their own models running and they don't have to, the responsibility for that, but they, they can subscribe as, uh, on the service. Okay, so if this, that's answering your question, but. Yeah, this kind of leads nicely onto Tom Pinella's um, comment about uh, commercial parties having proprietary rights. And, and I guess this, uh, this is, affects Delft as well. Is that how do how do governments supposed to manage that because they may have a fixed term contract with with one supplier and then at the end of that they want to change to a new system but however they're locked into proprietary systems. Yeah, yeah. How do we address um, that? And this yeah, is a that's, common, common issue uh, on a lot of our ADB finance projects. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, um, for that reason, at least our our software is open, and we we also work together with a lot of consultants all over the world who also use our software. So, um, very often, uh, uh, other consultants use our software to implement and to help governments. So, that is also to uh, avoid this. Um, but of course, maybe um, when. Uh, yeah, when you talk, I don't know if he, if he's really folk, uh, talking about forecasting as a service, then it's of course different. Um, but uh, well, at least it's the way we approach it with our software that it's open, everyone can use it. We can we want to train everyone, so um, 
So, so Very good. Um, yeah, governments have the opportunity to, to switch. Okay. Uh, Alan Jenkins also raises an interesting question and maybe he would like to, to ask it himself. I'll give you a couple of seconds to open your mic. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for a splendid talk, uh, Nadine. Uh, I'm just, uh, I, I think the, the, the futures that you talk about are already upon us. I think we all see that. Uh, the question is, how do we, how do we take the bones out of each one of those scenarios? Because it's, you said yourself, there has to be a, a mixture of all of them. And I can see that for flood forecasting, this localization uh, is, is, is potentially relevant. But what about when we move to seasonal and subseasonal forecasting over bigger areas and bigger transnational ban basins? Because their sharing and consistency of approach is absolutely essential. And, and I raise this because I'm responsible for the WMO's uh, Hydro SOS initiative or the development of it. And we're struggling with these problems at the moment. So I'd welcome your input. Yeah. Thank you for your question, um, Alan. Um, I don't know if you also attended the presentation of uh, my colleague, Albert Weertz, um, but he was also telling about the uh, more uh, global modeling, global modeling approach. And um, that is a way we are moving forward. Uh, also, in order to um, uh, have this uh, more uh, basin scale or, or widen scale, uh, approach so we can um, connect all data models and uh, we have uh, not only hydrology but also water quality uh, approach to that so we we are scaling up and then uh, we be also believe that uh, with the scaling up uh, in the end the um, the the resolution of these models will become uh, that high that we in the end you can just cut out a region where you can use it so uh, the reason why we use this this global modeling is that we then have this one approach one um, yeah uh, we have one approach one method uh, and we would like to develop that so we, we believe that it is it, it's you have to look in that uh, direction um, hopefully this is a bit answering your question Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Alan. Uh, okay, moving on, uh, a question or comment here from Ian uh, about when you mentioned impact, how are you defining impact? Does this mean impact on, uh, on services and people, uh, physical impact? And, and then if so, how are you collecting that information and in your forecasting? Um, well, it is, uh, of course, the, uh, the impact uh, is indeed, you have uh, the impact on, to make a good response, indeed, um, well, bus service will be interrupted or what you, what you write there. Um, and that, that's indeed correct. I believe if you look at the whole end-to-end -end forecasting, then it is from data towards uh, hydrological forecast towards a warning and then uh, also a response uh, that someone really uh, well sends out a message that you can't drive through that road like that. I think that is the whole end-to-end uh, uh, -end forecasting chain uh, including the, the, the impact but of course it depends also on the uh, type of organization that you are um, and well, also, of course, uh, from an institutional point of view, very often uh, the, the organization that issues the hydrological forecast is not the organization responsible for uh, the, the response. Uh, but I believe that it's important to connect those uh, more and that, uh, well, that not the one stops with just uh, water level while another person needs to know, okay, but I don't want a water level, but how, uh, what are the probabilities that a flood will occur and what will the water levels be? So I know that uh, this bus uh, can't drive to that road. So when I look at the, uh, at the ideal situation, that would be, uh, would be great if we, we can achieve that or organizations can achieve that. And of course, in, there are already uh, a lot of regions where this already is happening. Yeah, I, I think if if you're providing a, a forecasting 
service, then part of that would be to do a vulnerability assessment, which already maps out maybe on spatial information, but population and social data. So the planners know if a, if a safe flood comes at what level, then who, who is already affected. And then maybe during, during the response phase, then you'd rely more on social media and other real time information sources. Exactly, yeah. Tweak your plan yeah. and, and, and response to, to an event. Uh, quick, quick question. Indeed, in, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, I, I was also reading about the social media Twitter. Indeed, with, in Manila, uh, uh, they already use the, the Twitter messages um, also to inform, but also to uh, collect data. So that is something that's been implemented together with flood tags there and also in Indonesia. So yeah, for sure. Okay, so a quick question from Lai. Is the hydrological forecasting software free and available to everyone? Uh, the Delphi software is um, free of license, so uh, that's what we are always uh, saying. Available for everyone, you can download it uh, on our our website. Um, but I always say uh, you can use it. But in the end, um, what is also important is that you need support, uh, and of course, there will uh, support and maintenance will be uh, that that will be cost uh, uh, there. But um, if you don't use the support and maintenance, then it's free of uh, free of license. It is open software, and so um, um, everyone can use it. And also, you can connect your own models and data to it. Okay, very good. And we have a question here from Anadel Kabanban, if I said her name correctly. I think uh, this person would like some consulting services right away. They're asking. They're about to embark on a hydrological model and just. Uh, modeling and distress and support tool for a basin in the Philippines. Uh, should they use Delft uh, flood early warning system model and jumpstart to a model that is appropriate for 2025? Should we use and jumpstart to a model that is that this is appropriate for 2025? Uh, yes, I would say, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm not fully aware uh, if I really understand the question. I mean, um, yeah. Is, is, if you, yeah. Annadelle online, maybe Annadelle can, can ask the question. We'll give, give them a few yes, seconds. Thank you. Yes, we're, we're just about to um, engage a group of consultants or a tech um, group of experts to develop a model, hydrological model and a decision support tool for river basin management to, uh, to indicate where the critical areas for restoration or of river banks, for instance, or forest. Um, but uh, if uh, the future, this will still be available by 2022, uh -huh. but if the future of hydrological modeling will be different, um, you know, not based on this, um, uh, I think, hack RAS and hack MHS, um, should we should we just start using the Delft fuse model and and so we we're ahead of uh, the future scenario <laughs> okay um well of course the the Delft fuse platform uh, uh it's not a model it's just a platform that integrates data and models uh well it is currently available and it will still be available. I don't think the concept will change that much within the coming five years. Uh, and uh, I, I also think that the, well, still the physically based models such as HECRAS, et cetera, will uh, be in, still be important also uh, in the coming years. Um, so yes, I think what you're describing will still uh, fit with, uh, with a few and will be future proof. So, um, uh, but I think it's also good to uh, think about maybe new ways to approach it uh, and maybe also include if it, it goes by with data on maybe machine learning type of things. But I think it's always good to start with the basis uh, as a data handling platform and uh, hydrological models. Thank you Hope so much. answers your question. Yes, thank you. Yes. And please visit our website for more information also on the Delphi system and how it works. Yes, we'll do, definitely. Yeah. Thank you, Anadar. And uh, I noticed that uh, JJ Brinkman had his hand up. 
JJ, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, maybe, maybe I can add a little bit uh, to, uh, to uh, Abel's question and uh, please answer. I'm Diane okay, Bigel, okay. also from Bell Targets. Yeah. And I've lasted a half years and lived in, uh, I was based in, um, in Manila, Philippines, working together with Anna Del also. Um, uh, of course, all the, all the HackerRust and all the other models are important, like uh, Nadine already said. What we have available uh, for the Philippines is indeed in Delft Fuse, nearly all river basins already modeled, the hydrological basis. So it's, it's definitely a good start. Uh, what is also included in these models are all the satellite satellite data from uh, from uh, 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 the 90s up to now, uh, uh, and and that is a huge, a very rich data set to get started. Uh, you can easily use it as a basis. It's available uh, and it's also active in the in the Philippines already. Happy to further inform you. Thank you, Jan, yeah, for this uh, additional comment. Thank you. And we have, uh, I think we'll take this as the last question um, before we wrap up. So from Nivash Shrista, would you recommend combining Delft Fuse system with other hydrological models like HEC, HMS for flood, force flood force casting? Yeah, definitely. That's exactly where it's been designed for and what we are doing uh, all over the world, combining the, the Delft Fuse system with all different types of hydrological models like uh, HEC HMS as well. So um, yes, yeah, I definitely would recommend that. Excellent. Well, thank you, Nadine, and thank you everyone for your uh, questions and comments for Nadine. Uh, at you, this stage, um, I would like to, to hand over the session to Mr. Uh, Ton Segrin, who is the Director for Deltes International to, to say a few remarks since this is the, the last of the se season of sem seminars. Thank you. Well, my name is Toon Zeger. I'm uh, Director Deltares International. And uh, the series of webinars was titled Collaboration, Collaborating on Innovative and Sustainable Solutions for Integrated Water Management. And that pretty much covers how we work at Deltares. Collaboration, innovation, and sustainability is important in our work. Our partners, like the ADB, but many others in the world, chase, uh, face challenges. And uh, what we want to do at Deltares is to contribute to solutions by collaboration uh, with partners, not only in the Netherlands, but worldwide, sharing our knowledge. And Nadine talked about uh, uh, the openness of our software and, of course, through uh, innovation. And with uh, COVID-19, uh, we are faced with new challenges, both on content and on the way we work and collaborate, especially international, I would say. Climate change, sea level rise, health, sustainability are important issues to be dealt with. And COVID-19 doesn't change that. Uh, on the contrary, I would say. And webinars like the five we've had in this series are an efficient way to collaborate and to share our knowledge. Um, so to us, that was a, a successful series. I want to thank Tom, Jeff, and the team at the ADB. Your support was of great value. And at Altaris, we are very interested in exploring opportunities for further collaboration. We're looking forward to the next steps. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Tom. And I would like to now hand it over to Mr. Tom Panella, ADB's Chief of Water, uh, to say the final remarks. Yeah, thanks. Uh... Lance and, and Tune, and uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, Deltares and uh, their staff for the five presentations. And this really, um, they were very useful, but grew out of uh, discussions started through our Vice President of Knowledge Management, uh, who actually sits on Deltares uh, Advisory Board, to see how we can deepen our engagement with Deltares. And I think most of us who work at ADB in the water sector know that we already work with Deltares kind of on a project by project basis. And they've been involved in some of our more innovative projects and working on uh, climate change, nature-based solutions. And so um, what we'd like to do is see if we can come up with kind of a more pro programmatic way to engage with them. So this series of webinars was a, a start for that, but we'd also like to continue our knowledge sharing. And so for instance, our Asian Water Development Outlook, we've sent to them for review. We'll send uh, our water sector uh, framework 
uh, for review. And I know that Deltatus is also working on this new strategic document where they would uh, possibly like input from practitioners. Um, so we're hoping that uh, this is just a start uh, to greater collaboration because the challenges that we face in our region, climate change, uh, increasing challenges from land use change, uh, many of the water challenges uh, are going to just get worse and worse. And we all know that Deltaris is at the forefront of um, addressing these. So it makes sense to deepen the collaboration. Uh, we're grateful for this opportunity and look forward to further opportunities uh, to work together. So hopefully uh, you'll see more things coming in the future. And I'll turn it back to you, Lance. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so that's it for this session and a series of seminars. I'd like to thank again Nadine for her very good presentation. I'd like to thank all the participants for listening and, and uh, collaborating on the topic. Thank you to Fatun uh, from Deltez and Tom, uh, ADB, and I wish you all a very good day, afternoon and evening. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>